Today we're going to hear the inspirational story of Dr. Pablo Romero Beltran, who came to Salinas as a child from Mexico. He didn't speak English. He worked in the ag fields, as many immigrants do. Later he would serve in the U.S. Army and, against all odds, attend medical school and become a trusted family medicine doctor who views each day as an opportunity to help others. This is Ask the Experts, a podcast from Salinas Valley Memorial Healthcare System. I'm Scott Webb. So, Doctor, thanks so much for your time today. I'm uh, really looking forward to learning more about you. You have a really interesting and amazing story. And as we get rolling here, how old were you when you came to the U.S. and specifically California? I had just turned 14, so this is 1965, January. Somehow, I had spent a couple of years in Mexico working in, in construction after finishing grammar school. The reason that uh, I didn't go to any middle or high school is because it wasn't available to us. To go to the next level, it would have to be a very big sacrifice for the, for the family. So instead, I went to work. And then my dad he actually worked in, in the United States under the Bracero program. And so he went down for Christmas and then asked me, you don't seem to be too crazy with your work. Do you want to go to the U.S.? So we stopped by the American Embassy in Mexico City. We filled out some forms. And uh, there is your immigration papers. And so when it came time to, to leave, we left via second-class train from central Mexico, just north of Mexico City, to the California border, uh, took a cab from the train station to Calexico, got in, turned our papers in, and then got onto the, the Greyhound bus from Calexico all the way to Salinas, with the, <laughs> of course, with the stop in L.A. <laughs> Right. Was it just you and your folks uh, when you got to Salinas? So it was just me and my dad. The rest of the family stayed in Mexico because my dad was here working by himself and working in the farms. He was the only one here. Then he went down there. And it was just him and I came to California. And you mentioned school and, and why you uh, didn't go to uh, secondary school, you know, that just weren't available, too much of a sacrifice. And so when you got here with your dad, were you able to go to school at that time? No. I got here and I went to to live in a labor camp. And then from there, it was working. And uh, there was never an idea or a mention of a school. That wasn't uh, necessarily in the family plans. My dad had a second grade education. My mom had a first grade education. And being the oldest male, I was supposed to work to help the family. There were eight of us. And so somebody had to work and there was me. And so there was never a a question. I think only once there was... uh, I mentioned of school, and that's when I was in Arizona, at least a couple of years later, I was in the labor camp, and there was a raid of immigration service. And then the, the fellow, of course, woke me up and, and says, hey, Pancho, how old are you? <laughs> I said, well, first of all, I'm not Pancho, right. and uh, you know what you're saying. And so he asked me in Spanish how old I am, I said, I'm 16. And he goes, shouldn't you be in school? And I said, uh, I don't know. I right, right. I said, okay, yeah, let me see your green card. Here it is. Okay, goodbye. Bye to sleep. And so people didn't care. People just, if you produce the, the work, you know, uh, who cares about school? Yeah, and of course, uh, as we're going to get into, as we learn your whole story today, eventually you did go to school, medical school specifically. But I'm just curious, at that time between California and later Arizona, had you studied English? Had you learned English at that point? No. No English. I mean, it was uh, maybe a handful of phrases. In fact, when I finally got to school, it's called the U.S. Army being drafted. Mm-hmm. So I got drafted in uh, 1970, and I went to a swearing-in ceremony in Oakland. And I really knew that there was something different that happened because we, there were a bunch of us in a room, and people in the front were raising their hand. People in the middle were, were giving the finger. People in the back were the peace guys with the peace sign. And I knew there was something was different. So when I came out of there, I asked our Spanish-speaking officer, what happened there? He goes, what do you mean, what happened? I said, I have no idea what happened. He goes, well, you're in the Army. You don't speak English? I say, no. He goes, you're going to leave quickly or you're going to get into a lot of trouble. So that was my introduction. What a story, doctor. I mean, so you come to America, uh, you work in the fields because that's what you have to do because you've got eight members of your family and it's just expected. So no school, no English, and then somehow you end up in the Army, still no English, right? So tell us about this experience. What was the Army like for you? Where were you stationed? When did you learn English? Did you become, you know, really fluent at some point? Well, again, I, I went from Salinas and ended up going to a Fort Ord in, 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 here in California, which is 
15 miles from Salinas. Foror was very active training uh, people in basic training. But I was very, very fortunate that, that I ended up with a bunch of people from the National Guard going through the basic training. And they took it upon themselves to teach me the language as much as they could in between learning uh, the, the Army. I was helping them with physical things because they were all kind of chubby. They were National Guardsmen. And I was very, in very top shape for, for working in the fields. So they took it upon themselves to teach me. Granted that at the end of eight weeks, most of my English was uh, bad words. Mm. Um, as you can imagine, the Army teaches you a lot of bad words. Yeah. And so <laughs> among other bad words, I did learn some of the language. From there, I went to Fort Chill, Oklahoma for the second part of the training. And there I said, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of stuck in this business. I better learn the language more seriously. And I, I decided to go to, to all the movies, to go to the library and take books out. And then a lot of people helped me. Uh, with some of the findings. And then it became a, a career to learn the language. And since here I am, I'm going nowhere. I better learn the language. Yeah. So you serve your time in the army. And it sounds like that's when you begin to kind of find your passion for helping people, which I'm sure later paid off becoming a doctor. You learn English, the good words, the bad words. And it's probably just been a lifelong, you know, education process. Right. And so what did you do when you got out of the army? So when I got out of the Army, it seems like January has a lot of things for me. You know, I came into the U.S. in January to Salinas. And when I got out of the Army, again, here we go again, it's another January. I was considering going to Arizona to follow the lettuce season. That was my former job. I worked in the lettuce, and it's very seasonal. And I get to Salinas, and then I said, you know, uh, maybe I should take a little break and see what happens. Well, somebody told me, why don't you try to see if there's anything at the, at the local college, community college? called Harnell. So I went there and I said, you know, I just started the army. My English is getting better, but I still I mean the academics is not something that I've done yet. Uh, do, do you have anything available? I said, yeah, yeah, we have a program where we can test you and then we can place you. And so I got tested and I got placed at everything at the very bottom from arithmetic to grammar to whatever. But it was self-paced. So I, I went through it very, very quickly. And so I went from arithmetic to eventually second year calculus from introduction to science, to physics, and, and all that. And so I kind of liked it. This is uh, the first semester. The lettuce started again, and I they decided to work half-time in the lettuce with my dad. Uh, he'll do one, half of the shift, I'll do the other one, while going to the local community college. So I stayed at the community college, and I took all the courses that, requ that require a pathway for science. And, of course, at the same time, somebody told me that you if you're going to take this serious, you need to do quite well. So you were never happy with an A, you won the highest grade in the class. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up. It looked to me like science was a thing to do. It was an equalizer. And that's how I ended up being more interested in science and then eventually in medicine. I mean, what an inspirational story, right? Just uh, we're tracking this whole journey, you know, from from Mexico City to the fields in Salinas, and then eventually you know, Army going to college, but you're still working lettuce and going to college, and you realize how important grades are and doing well, and then ultimately, right, you go to medical school. So tell us about that. Yeah, so somehow I got an introduction to UC Irvine. Somebody came in to, to do some recruiting, and and then they offer me, a, you know, a great thing, which is called a region scholarship, which pays for pretty much for everything. So I, I could just study instead of having to worry about bills or whatever. Science was quite good. I was thinking of, of a career in biochemistry. And medicine was quite foreign. When I came here for several years, there was nobody, no, there were no doctors who spoke Spanish. So there were no models, no role models whatsoever. Uh, if you broke your, your wrist, you went to the hospital and you had to have translators or whatever. So medicine for me was not necessarily a, uh, a reality. So I went to UC Irvine and there I was introduced to the idea of medicine since there's more docs in Orange County and more models. And so I said, let me try it. Of course, they told me, go to medicine and go to UC Irvine and will you get a free ride all the way? And I said, well, I kind of wanted to come back towards home, which is Northern California, Salinas. And so I ended up taking a position at UCSF, and which was probably the best decision I've made in my life. Of course, UCSF is a fantastic medical school. Uh, we have well, top graduates from all over the country. But guess what? We're all equal. We're all 
at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> medical, <laughs> medical students are absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go to the to anatomy, you know, it's like it was great because it was a, a huge equalizer. I went to medical school, and then after that, I, I was thinking of going to to surgery. I was really good in surgery, but. I, I was also made aware of the fact that when I was here in uh, the community college, that I thought about medicine for the people here. So I said, well, let me try family practice one year in, in residency. Mm-hmm. So I started the residency, and then, I, of course, after that, I finished the residency and realized that if I want to make a difference in this town, you need to do something more sustainable. So I went ahead and uh, formed a, a, a group. and. There were no real groups necessarily at the time who of Doc School who did family practice and, and took care of the Spanish speaking community. So my group was one of the first ones and we opened up a practice and and you know, here we are, many years later. Right. Yeah, still thriving and it's so great to connect those dots and see how you got to family medicine and it really does just feel like you're Mm-hmm. You know, living the American dream, as you say, you continue to help the community. And why is that so important to you? You know, helping the community, giving back to the community, helping the ag workers. It sounds like a real high priority for you. I'd just like to have you talk about it a little bit. Yeah, it is because coming to Salinas as a kid and making uh, the minimum wage, which actually the minimum wage in those days, as it is now, is different for farm work. And for the country, it was $1.25 an hour. For farm work was a dollar, and if you can work for a dollar, and then you provide all those eating vegetables for, for people and and whatever, I think that's kind of a great thing. So what do you do going forward, and how do you pay back? Well, you pay back by making sure that people have access to care, by make, making sure that bad situations don't don't take place. Every single day, I have a lot of things to cover. Uh, uh, misdiagnoses, misunderstandings, all of these things. And so I think the community always needs help and, and, and guidance. We also established a couple of scholarships, one at UCSF for farm working people. And then we did another one at Harnell College, again, for people who want to study science and who come from farm working backgrounds. And I think it's important. I could have bought probably four or five Teslas without money, but then what will I do? Park him and then watch him getting old. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't have a Tesla. <laughs> right. You know, since you interact so often with members of the community, what advice do you give young people, especially immigrants, perhaps advice about enlisting in the armed forces and your experiences? Share that advice with listeners. I ended up with three daughters, and of course, they all, they all went straight to NYU, Harvard, and USC. But they have my background in economics. Some of these folks don't have the same access. Some of these folks are, don't necessarily know what they want to do with their lives. And if you don't, guess what? You can go and learn something, learn a trade, learn something. You can be, you can learn to draft things, to uh, be a great mechanic, to be a logistics person. Learn that for free in the armed forces. Think of where you are, think where you want to go next. And then maybe if you want to, you can stay in the armed forces and help the country. Or if not, then take what you have in there and come back to the community. And now you become a great diesel mechanic. Or you can go work for UPS and deliver packages. Or if you're a medic, then you can go back here and become an RN. Or go to a medical school if you want to. All of that. Yeah, so many great opportunities, you know, come from serving, of course. And obviously, I, I want to thank you for your service. Wish you a happy Veterans Day. As we wrap up here, Doctor, what's your advice for veterans? I, I'm sure you have plenty and, and thoughts about, you know, what it's like to serve and what you do when you get out of the service. What you need to do is you need to feel proud that you did what you did. Uh, things change. There could have been a lot of traumatic events. Adjust yourself to the new reality. You are a human being. You're able to, to learn. You're able to use the gifts that you have with you and work to better yourself and your family. And then as a side effect, also the community, you, you can do that and then be proud of what you've done. Be proud of having been a great artillery man, but then now you're a great welder or you're a great councilman or, or whatever. The limitations are all in your head. Free it up and learn a new thing and then help the community and help yourself. A lot of us can just Go home and become obese, eating hamburgers and whatever, or you can go around and see how you can help the community. 
Yeah, uh, that's a perfect way to finish. I mean, nothing wrong with hamburgers and cheeseburgers, but <laughs> also uh, make time to help the community as you've done. And what an amazing journey and amazing life you've had. So great to hear about your daughters and how well they've done. So, Doctor, thank you so much for your time today. And sincerely, you stay well. Thank you. You too. For more information, visit our website at svmh.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you found this podcast to be helpful, please be sure to tell a friend, neighbor, or family member and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And check out the entire podcast library for additional topics of interest. This is Ask the Experts from Salinas Valley Memorial Healthcare System. I'm Scott Webb. Stay well, and we'll talk again next time.